back. So today I wanted to do a video that I'm kind of nervous about. I have wanted to talk about this for many, many years. Um, so since I'm a little bit nervous, I wanted to kind of get ready. Um, I have a couple new products that I want to test for me. I'm not really going to talk about any of the products today, but I wanted to do something while I'm doing this. So um, if you're curious about what I'm using, just let me know and I'll tell you, I don't think anyone's going to really care, but yeah. So today I wanted to talk about why I left the church. And the reason I want to talk about this is a couple months ago, um, I saw this one guy on YouTube, his name is Josh. I don't remember what his channel is called, but I first found him because of the Micah Stoffer situation that occurred. Um, but he was actually an ex worship pastor and he kind of shared his experience in the church. But it got me thinking, you know, a lot of people probably have had this experience, but it has not really been normalized whatsoever like taboo to talk about so i'm going to tell you my experience with the church so i want to kind of give you some background about me and my kind of spiritual journey i started going to church when i was very very young i went with my family every week to a Lutheran church. That's how I was raised, was Lutheran. So, didn't really like it. Very traditional, wasn't really my thing. We ended up stopped going to church. We moved several times while I was a child. So, I tried some different churches in my teen years, and ultimately, it was, I think I was either a junior or a senior in high school where I found my church home. So the church I went to um, was started by an Australian family. Um, they moved to the United States to start a church um, and it was really small and I really enjoyed that because I essentially knew everyone in the church. Everyone knew everybody. Um, it wasn't like super gossipy or anything. Um, and then they had some family issues, so they actually, um, contacted one of their friends that ran a church in Virginia. So, essentially this church took over. And they brought in two people they thought would, uh, do well to run the church. And we became, like, a section of their church. So, these two people became two of my best friends. I still talk to them to this day. They are absolutely beautiful people. And I loved church. I went there for five years. And eventually the church that was kind of over us pretty much told us we were, I mean, they didn't say this, but it, you could tell this was the reason we weren't bringing them enough money. We had about a 60 person church and we had been doing this for five years. So, you know, they felt that since we weren't really growing, um, that it was time to essentially end the church. I was devastated. I did the worship team while I was there. I did like the audio and visual team. Um, I was super involved, was at my pastor's house multiple times a week. I was in love with church. So directly after that happened, I went and started visiting other churches. It was probably the worst day of my life when we had to tell the congregation because I was on the leadership team. And so like at the end of the service, the next day we were telling them, you know, hey, this is our last service. So it was horrible. Everyone was crying. It was one of the worst 
experiences of my life. So me and my boyfriend at the time went and visited other churches. We probably looked for about six months. Then I don't even know. I think like through Facebook, we found this church and they were another startup and that, you know, we felt like was on our heart. We like small churches. We want to be a part of like the ground up, essentially part of a church. That's just who we were. That's what we enjoyed. We loved, you know, the small church atmosphere. We had visited many churches, big, small, medium, and the big ones just did not feel as personal. Um, I just am not a fan of mega churches. So we found this church, got really involved, and I felt like it was a really good fit for us. So we were there for a couple years. Um, we ended up breaking up multiple times at this point and I started on and off going. Dating somebody in the church and then not being together is uh, not the easiest thing in the world. So I was so on and off again just because of my emotions. But eventually he left the church and I started going more regularly again. I started volunteering. Um, I never did worship team or anything at this church. Um, and then we start getting into some of the issues in 2016. So as you know, in 2016 was the presidential election. Now this is the first election that I felt that I had knowledge to actually speak on things. In 2008, I was still very young. I had just graduated high school. I didn't know a whole lot of anything. So in school, you guys know, I learn about policy, the system, um, just how corrupt things are. And if you don't think, don't think things are corrupt, then you need to do some more research. But, so I started being a little more opinionated on Facebook, because that was my main social media at the time. And I was told by multiple church members that I didn't know what I was talking about. I um, was misinformed. I was going against the Bible, all sorts of things. And I remember thinking to myself that, you know, I, I respect everyone's opinion. Do I agree with you? Absolutely not. Do I agree with all the things? But I, I just didn't realize like how horrible politics made people. And it started making me question things. And throughout the years, I have become more and more resentful of not the church, but of Christians because I, I just don't understand the thought process. So I was told at one point by a leader in the church that I was too young and I would not understand about all of it. So essentially thinking that Democrats just take everyone's money. Hi, editing me here. I found the conversation that I had with the person because it was via this Facebook chat. By the way, I have Invisalign now, so if my talking sounds a little weird, that's why. But I thought it was really important to discuss, like actually read the conversation for you guys. Um, I was in kind of a weird headspace when I recorded this video. So, um, I did like do a, like when I talk about serious stuff, I record myself like just vocally and then I will go back later and actually record it. So if I can find that, I'm actually going to place it at the end of this because it's a lot more detailed. Um, and I could not find my notes for this. So if I'm kind of all over the place, that's why. But this conversation I actually had was with the pastor of the church. Um, and I want to read it for you word for word because I think 
it's necessary for you guys to kind of see where I'm coming from. If you didn't know, I am very uh, not Republican, not conservative. So I'm going to read this to you. So I said, not to be rude, but there are some people who are liberal in the church. He had posted a, a meme, like a Republican meme. And he said, I can see your, your point, but I absolutely don't agree with stealing money from the rich and making them give to people who don't work is in the spirit of fairness. If he was for being fair, he wouldn't be stealing from anyone, right? I said, I don't consider it stealing. A lot of people who are billionaires put their money in offshore accounts or evade tax evasion or yeah, whatever so they don't have to pay taxes. And we bail out these big companies, which also I don't think is right. I think everyone should pay the same taxes. The middle class should not be paying the majority. I'm gonna switch angles. He said, I wouldn't disagree with you that hiding money is wrong, but I am talking about, but I'm not talking about that scenario. I'm talking about the fact that you earn your income by working 40 hours a week. Then all of a sudden you are told you need to not only support yourself, but also somebody who is capable of working, but isn't. Huge misconception. Um, the majority of people, like the high, high majority of people that can work and are on um, government assistance do work. They are just underpaid due to our minimum wage not increasing for the last 20 years. Oh, apparently I said that. I said the majority of people who are MOFAR are working, minus those who are disabled. Only 5% of people in the system are able to work, but don't. The facts that some news sources say about social services is so misconstrued, and the only reason I can say that is because of the intense research I've done on the subject. I've done a lot of research. Many 20, 25 page papers on social services. I said, but we can agree to disagree. What, and he said, what would happen if Burn Inc. made everyone equal in everything? Is the companies that are creating jobs and making money will go overseas and leave America because of the rules here. People want to become wealthy, and if they can't do it here, they will do it in other countries where it's easier. This will result in the loss of jobs, loss of big companies to pay the rest of us. I am for people making a reasonable wage, but if the company doesn't have the money to pay the person, someone is losing their job. I do want to say that after you get out of college and are in the next stage of life, you will not be wanting to pay for someone else's tuition. The money has come from somewhere. If we have free tuition away, all the workers at the school have to be paid. I mean, this means higher taxes, less money to feed my kids for making a livable wage. That is what minimum wage was created for. If you work 40 hours a week, you should not be living in poverty. But some of these companies don't give anybody a chance. He said, I see both sides on this for sure. I think anyone working over 40 hours a week should be able to make a living. I know the unemployment rates were through the roof. Six out of 10 were unemployed and laid off. This resulted in more government assistance. The message sent to kids regarding how to raise a family is terrible. The more we need to rely on government, the worse off we will be. The more we let them make decisions for us, the closer we are to a dictatorship. <laughs> Sorry. Things start out fine when they tell us stuff we agree with. Then what happens is we trust them with more power. After a while, they will be taking away freedoms that we hold dear to us. By that point, we have nothing we can do about it. Again, just my opinion, the money has to come from somewhere. I think it's interesting that this guy believes that we are going to be better off by giving away all these things and expecting people who have worked hard to pay for it. And I ended the conversation with, here's my biggest issue. I think big corporations have skated by far, for far too long. It's amazing how corporate welfare has done such horrible things to the middle class. As you know, the middle class pays the majority of the taxes. I don't think that's right. So instead of letting them get away with it, we should step up. These things will get paid for by taking away the tax breaks for the rich. I understand your frustration. I absolutely do. It's not right that somebody making 40 to 50 K a year is struggling. 
I know for me, with my loans, I would be in serious trouble. But as far as tuition, if I showed you how much I owe, it would blow your mind. I don't want tuition to be free, but it should be affordable. Inflation on tuition does not make sense. The whole middle class has been carrying the burden for far too long, and that needs to end. If you really listen to Bernie, he is for the middle class. So... That was in February of 2016, and by the time the election was over, well, you'll see. Uh, I will get more into that shortly. And just wants everyone to make the same, no matter how lazy or hardworking you are. So that rubbed me the wrong way. And then I noticed other things. Other leaders in the church just posting, like, backhanded racist things. This is when Black Lives Matter first started. Um, just horrible, horrible things. Um, so I started deleting people left and right. I felt like I was not welcome in the church because of my political beliefs. Um, it was just, there were certain people in the church I could talk to and I knew they would come in with no judgment and be nice and understanding and even if they didn't agree with me, they weren't horrible. I felt like I did not belong in the church anymore. And I had some issues in the past. Every church is full of people, you know, like things are going to go in disarray sometimes because people are people and I don't hold that against anybody, but overall, I felt ashamed of my beliefs at times. I felt ashamed that I called myself a Christian when, you know, the majority of Christians were okay with police killing people, were okay with um, justifying black people being in jail, are okay with truly believing that black people are more dangerous than white people. And I just, I didn't understand that. I am an empath to the core. Like, I feel what people feel. And I hadn't even started my career yet at this point. My career started in 2017, at the very beginning of 2017. So, this whole election is going on. I am so confused at this point. Like, what, what do I do? I love these people, but I don't understand them. And it's going against my morals and my beliefs. Just lost, essentially. I, in my heart of hearts, believe that God loved all people. Poor people, rich people, black people, white people, Asian people, Hispanic people, whoever. All people. And I just felt like this hate from Christians that I didn't understand. Like, what if you're wrong? Like, what if your philosophy is just wrong? There are plenty of dangerous white people. And if you're going to put people into a group, the majority of mass murderers are white Christian men. So, explain that to me. That's like saying, like, oh, all Christians. Since a couple people are bad people, that means all Christians are bad. And it just didn't make sense to me. So thing after thing after thing kept happening. It wasn't just this church. It was Christians. I was so lost and confused. And I, I didn't understand how people who love God could think this way. So focused on themselves you know like well um you know the the all poor people are lazy and don't deserve government assistance is essentially what i was seeing over and over again and obviously now like as a social worker working in the system i know that's not true a lot of people who are on welfare do not stay on it very long. It's actually impossible to stay on it a super long time. 
even though popular belief is people stay on it for life, it's literally not possible. You can be on like SSI if you have a disability, but you can't just be on government assistance for life. But anyway, oh, all this was happening. Obviously, if you were around during the election in 2016, you know like how this country was. We had the Black Lives Matter movement going on. We had the biggest election in history because of Trump. Trump just brought out the racism in America and it's only gotten worse since then. But it, it was just a horrible time. Everyone's true colors have pretty much come out since then at that time and then it's just gotten worse. And I couldn't handle it anymore. As an empath, I literally could not handle the hate that I was seeing from my fellow Christians. And I didn't understand it. I didn't understand when over and over and over and over and over in the Bible it says, help the needy and the poor. Help the orphaned and the poor. Help the widowed and the poor. Over and over and over and over and over and over again. But yet, you think it's okay to just be like, no, they're lazy. They're all lazy. I, I've seen one person uh, abuse food stamps, so that must mean they all do. How ridiculous does that sound? And I am not saying like Republicans as a whole are like this at all. Like I have many family members who are Republican um, who don't think that way, but I also have many family members who are Republican that do think that way. So I'm not saying it's a one size fits all, but all the people in my life, even people from the church that I used to go to, like had this philosophy that poor people were lazy, didn't deserve assistance, and they were just trying to take from us. When, if you actually like do research on the system, it's the rich that are stealing from the poor. The rich have all these bank accounts in other countries, so they don't have to pay taxes on it. And so what happens? Our taxes get raised to compensate for it. Yes, there is a bracket system for our taxes, but it doesn't really work if they don't pay the taxes at all. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> but anyway, so all this is happening in 2016, just a shit show. All these things have happened in the past. Um, I was in an MLM and then the pastor's wife got in an MLM and there was like some arguments between us because stupid shit. I don't care about it now. MLMs can burn in hell for all I care. But there was that. There was the jabs that I was getting like about my views um, and I didn't understand it. So I um, left after that, probably a couple weeks before the election, I was just like, I can't do this anymore. I mean, it was during, you know, busy times for me at work anyway, but that didn't make a difference. I always made time for church. And I went back a couple times. Then after I started my job, I just didn't go back at all. I went for like maybe a month after I started my job, started learning more and more about this lazy population that people like to call, working with them every single day. I work with the homeless, the poor, all of it, the high class, all of them every single day. And I just couldn't, I could not deal anymore. So. I left because I didn't believe that the church has morals anymore. And when I say the church, I mean the Christians. I love Jesus. I pray every single night. I love God. There's nothing that will ever stop me from loving God. But his people make me sick. His people hurt my heart. His people I don't understand. If you go to church every Sunday, I am not shaming you. I hope that you find a church different. 
than mine. My first church, if those pastors ever come back here and start a church, I would a thousand percent go. But when I was shamed and told I was too young to understand politics and that money matters more than people essentially is what I was getting at. That doesn't sit right with me. And the more and more I've been gone from the church, the more and more I don't think I'll ever go back because there's so many pastors who make millions of dollars and they're not giving back to the community. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. Isn't the whole point of the church is to bring the broken and the abused in and help them? Why aren't we doing more is my thought process. So that is why I left the church. And I'm okay with it. I know I love God with all my heart. A lot of people don't understand it. But for me, I had to do it for my mental health, for my spiritual health. I couldn't, I couldn't go on in that environment. If I ever find a church that is welcoming to all thoughts and not racism and hate, I would definitely be open to it. But as of right now, I don't know if a church like that exists. So I won't be returning until I feel it's time. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you are doing well. Please make sure you are registered to vote so we can make a change in this country in November. We need it desperately. I love you guys and I'll see you soon. Bye. So today I wanted to tell my story about why I left the church. This is something that's been on my mind for a very long time and I've always wanted to talk about it but there is a youtuber his name is Josh um, I'll put his channel name above but he recently came out and is doing a series about being fired from the church and it just made me realize that there's so many people that have stories that haven't been shared and before I go into this, I want to say churches are filled with people. People are filled with flaws. Every church will have its issues, um, but it doesn't mean your story is invalid. And you can still love Jesus without belonging to a church. You can still tithe without giving money to a church but I'll get into all that later so I want to give you some background on my church history I went to some Methodist or Lutheran church churches with my parents growing up didn't really like them we stopped going probably when I was like 12 or 13. I went to a couple of youth events with some friends um, and I gave my life to Jesus in, what year was that? I gave my life to Jesus in 2005. I went to a church camp with one of my friends and for some reason, I just stopped going to church at that time. Um, I went every once in a while with my friends, but it wasn't anything too serious. Then I went to my church, which was a tiny church in a daycare center. And that was in 2008 the year that I graduated high school. And I fell in love with the church. Um, 
But shortly thereafter, something happened with the pastor and he ended up having to leave. And I met two people who will be some of my best friends for my entire life. And I have some friendships from there that I will have forever. Some people I don't talk to anymore, but they're still great people. That church, I never had struggles like I did in the second church. So we were affiliated with a much larger church. We had probably like 60 people at our church and we just had a really hard time growing, but everybody there loved Jesus and was there for Jesus and that's it. Our pastor had a full-time job. He worked 60 or 70 hours a week at his normal job and then every other second he spent with either his family or on the church. And him and his wife are two of the most selfless people I've ever met. And again, they will be my friends forever. But we were affiliated with this big church. And unfortunately, that big church decided that since we weren't growing that we needed to not be a campus anymore. So without their support, we had to close down the church. I will never forget that Sunday because I was on the leadership team and the day before we met with um, people from the bigger campus and they said, you know, tomorrow we're telling everybody, you know, that we're no longer gonna be a campus. And that was the hardest worship set I've ever done in my entire life. I, if I didn't mention I was on the worship team, I was on the tech team, I was on every team that there was. Um, and that's, that's how small church life is, is you have many roles um, in hopes that one day you'll overcome that obstacle. But I'll never forget that day when I was standing on our, if you want to call it a stage, we were in a hotel um, lobby, or not lobby, a hotel like event room. And when the pastor from the other church came and said that, I the whole room exploded in tears because you know when they say church family, you don't really understand it. But that, truly we were all family. We were all, there were no real cliques in our church. People came and went, of course, like any other church. But we were really a family. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever gone through. So <clears throat> that happened in 2013. Me and my boyfriend at the time went to many, many churches after that and tried to find one that would fit. I was a small church girl at heart. That's where I always felt the most connected. We went to so many churches and half of them didn't even have an altar call. And that's one thing that is very important to me is like, that's... The church shouldn't be for the Christians. The church should be for those that aren't saved, in my opinion. So having flashy lights and all that doesn't matter to me. But all these churches really only cared about themselves. I remember going to a, one service and the lead pastor's like, Yeah, somebody told me that I wouldn't have a big house uh, this size, but I have one four times the size he has. So stuff like that just rubbed me the wrong way. But finally we found a very, very, very small church. I think there was like 12 people. Um, so we got there right when they like were starting up. And that was in 2014, so about a year after. And I 
fell in love with this church and I was so happy thinking that you know it, it was possible to find a church like my old church that there could be family and it was like that for a couple years probably like a year and a half straight we went from a daycare center to an elementary school to um well i didn't get past oh no no, no. the elementary school and then we had like our own little church in like this corner um shopping center and then they eventually moved to a huge huge church but I wasn't there for that so I left in August of 2016 and I haven't been to a church since then so I kind of want to go through everything that happened so like I said I loved the church I was friends with a lot of people um, we were up to maybe like two or three hundred at this point and it was the year of the election. And there's small things that I'm gonna go over as well, but the straw that broke the camel's back was that election. I remember being told by the lead pastor when I shared com some concerns about, you know, him leaning Republican that I didn't understand. I was young. I didn't have kids. I didn't understand how the tax system worked and that, um, that I was just naive. And when I would get older, I would become more conservative, which if you don't know about me, I was pretty much born a conservative. My whole family is conservative. And I went and got my master's and learned about policy and did lots and lots and lots and lots of research so I I learned very much so like how the political system works it I had several classes that all we did was go over policy and reports and statistics and all that stuff so I have a lot of knowledge in that area which a lot of people discredit so when he told me that I was I was Kind of taken aback because what I had said to him was, hey, just so you know, you have some liberal people in the church too. You probably, you know, should stay pretty neutral. That's just my opinion, you know, like there are certain things like same-sex marriage. He doesn't really talk. He never really talked about that um, because, you know, people technically lean one way or another. So that was... The first thing I was like, okay, um, all right. Cause this was the first year that I was voting, um, because the previous election I was very young and I just didn't vote. Um, but things came out slowly over the year of 2016 that really, really took me aback and broke my heart. You know, people clearly like posting things on Facebook, people I loved, people I consider family in the church, um, like calling black people thugs or um, saying that, you know, everybody on welfare is just lazy and doesn't want to work. And there's so many misconceptions, you know, even the other day I was talking to my mom and she said, oh yeah, people stay on unemployment for years. I'm like, well, no, that's not true. And there's just so many misconceptions about welfare and it's just funny to me because I know so much about this, but it's impossible to stay on it for years. Like it is impossible. Of course, is there fraud? Of course, but our fraud level for our social programs are so low. Even the people that need it can't get it most of the time. That's how hard it is to get in these programs. But so I just started unfriending people and it was really hurting my heart like you guys i don't know if i've told you but this year i've unfriended over 150 people because if you don't support the black lives matter movement then i don't support you because it just doesn't make any sense to me and i also just didn't understand how people could vote for trump you know when I think of the Republican Party, I always think they talk about family values. 
and I'm sorry, you're probably going to disagree with a lot of that I say, and that's totally fine, but I think Trump is a piece of shit. I think Trump, he, you know, allegedly has some cases pending for minor sexual assault. Um, he has been married several times, cheated on almost all of his wives. So why are we celebrating that? And I remember a family member of mine one time said it's not about the person, it's about the policy. And I absolutely disagree. That person is representing our country. And it hurts my heart because I people like were so, so mean about Michelle Obama. And regardless of what way you sway, like why? Why do we have to talk about looks? It's just absolutely ridiculous. So I couldn't understand why anyone I loved or cared for, and I've had this problem not with the church, but with the last four years with Trump. I don't understand how anyone could support him no matter what party you're affiliated with. So I was growing more and more weary. And you have to remember that, obviously I've done the research, but in my line of work, I see things that the normal person doesn't see. I see how these policies are so horrible with people for mental illness or black families or low income families. Um, I see all these things on a daily basis. And even like nurses don't see half the stuff that us as social workers see or caseworkers or counselors. And so people trying to tell me things about something that I experience every day doesn't it just doesn't sit right with me so don't try to tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about that I'm naive that I'm young you have no idea and my last thing as it regards to the election was how we can put money over people. And this has been a constant issue for me since I have been older and, you know, learn more about politics and policy and all that. But I just don't understand how people would rather have more money than help people that are in need. They're not lazy. Yes, are there some people on welfare that are lazy? I'm sure there are. But I see these people every day. Half of them... Like, some of my patients, if they have to pay child support, they get, like, $400 a month. And they're mentally ill, so they can't, like, get a job. So, acting like these people are just living in a luxurious lifestyle is just absolutely ridiculous. Do people manipulate the system? Of course, every system can be manipulated. But it doesn't mean that they don't, the people that need it don't deserve it. That doesn't make any sense, right? People can manipulate any system. Whether it's government funded or whatever it is. That doesn't mean people don't deserve a chance. Number two. Money. Money just didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, I've always struggled with the fact that there are people like Joel Osteen who have like million multi-million dollar mansions and my pastor the last one I had before I left the church he used to say if the church did what it was supposed to we wouldn't need welfare the church would take care of its people and I believe that wholeheartedly the church brings in so much money there's no reason for them not to be helping more. But I noticed the money that we were giving was going to TV screens, new lights. Our pastor lived in a $350,000, $400,000 house. I don't disagree that, you know, pastors should live comfortably, but it's a little much for a pastor, in my opinion. I, I know for me, I live in a very um, nice home. Um, 
it's not excessive. It's a 1600 square foot home, nothing too large, but I, I can make my home work for me. I don't need a large home. So that always has given me a hard time. Um, that they really should have been giving back more. I feel like they almost gave more when they were smaller as compared to now where they say that they need $40,000 a month from people tithing. And in Josh's video, he said, you know, tithing in the Bible is so misconstrued. And I really thought about it. When you look at the Bible, it says, bring, you know, your first fruits, your first 10%. Um, but there was no money back then. You know, there were animals or crops or whatever. And so tithing your time, giving to a charity, it doesn't have to necessarily be a church, but the church has kind of manipulated things in a way that I don't understand. Um, this has nothing to do with money, but another thing is gay marriage. I, I just can't wrap my head around a God that would say two people who love each other and get married aren't beautiful. Like they're just like you and me, you know, just wanting to get married and have kids and have life and have a house and a good job. I think, no, I could totally be wrong about this, but I really don't think I am. I think that in the Bible, it wasn't talking about homosexuality. It was talking about being promiscuous, being hypersexual, sleeping with a bunch of people, doing drugs, um, just living a very promiscuous lifestyle. And maybe back then, gay people did that. But that, maybe back then, that's all they could do because of the situation of the time. I truly think that if we could look back at the original text, it would be much different than the translated version. So that's all I really wanted to say about money was just the flashy stuff didn't make sense to me instead of helping the community. Number three is my issues with the pastor's wife. There are so many issues. Um, I, I had a really hard time. I tried so hard to connect with this woman because in my heart, I felt like she didn't have any friends. I felt she, you know, was home with her kids or doing her um, other church things, but she didn't really make time for herself. Um, and that really bothered me. So I tried to include her in things, um, you know, and she would always say no. And I just felt like very judged by her. I was obviously in a relationship living with my boyfriend who um, did not, we obviously weren't married. So um, I just felt very judged by her. And then this is going, this is so small. I just want you to know compared to all the other stuff, but I want to say like what's on my heart, like what happened. Um, but you guys know I was selling lip scents a while ago, years ago. Um, and then she started, like I said, she wasn't really hanging out with friends or anything like that. Um, and then she started this business. She started to take all my customers and that just rubbed me the wrong way. So, um, that was, you know, that was another reason why I left was because I felt like I tried so hard to reach out to her and be kind to her. And she kind of did that to me. Obviously it didn't matter regardless, but. And then the final thing, which kind of ties everything together is losing respect for people that I've loved. There are so many people in my life, not even just in the church that I will, I can't understand in this climate of the world. People who'd be willing to put guns before children's safety. People who are willing to put money before people. People who have the audacity to think Black Lives Matter means anti-white or kill all the white people. 
They literally just want to be treated like everyone else. And to this day, I don't understand why anyone would be against that. I don't understand how any white person can safely, confidently say like, no, that this is what the movement means and I'm against that. Like you are a white person. You don't understand. And what I have such a problem with is people not having conversations instead of just making blanket statements. So right before the election, I left the church in August of 2016. I have not gone to another church since. I pretty much told myself, you know, if my old two pastors ever come back and start a church, um, that I would definitely go. Um, but it would have to take them coming back for me to go back to church. Because so many people in church are such so right-leaning. And I don't mind people who are Republican. Like, my whole family is Republican. But saying, like, invalidating black people's feelings, posting essentially racist things... Um, I can't, I can't be on board with, I can't, if you guys don't know, I am a huge empath. That is why I'm so good at my job as a therapist is I feel what people are feeling and I have heard so many horrible stories, you guys, from the black community, the amount of people who have been sexually or physically abused in their childhood and ended up in foster care and you know they aged out and they had nowhere to go so now they're homeless 18 year olds trying to figure out the world and they have to end up selling drugs to survive and people are calling them lazy it's just it breaks my heart you have no idea what these kids go through or there's the other side where it's families trying to do the best they can, but they make such limited amount of money that they can't afford the services to help their 18 year old who just had their first psychotic break. You guys have no idea what these kids go through. So that's why I left the church. I still love Jesus with all my heart, but I don't think I'll be back. If you have a similar experience, let me know. I would love to hear it. Thank you.